Good evening. Uh, my name is Leanne Litwiller, and I am an English professor at Spring Hill College. Uh, Spring Hill is a Jesuit liberal arts college of about 1,500 students uh, on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and it's interesting, when we were planning this forum, we talked about how complimentary this is. We have a small institution that's focusing kind of on a teaching project, and we have a larger institution that has a lot of programming that it does really excellent work. And we hope that this will be a complimentary sort of blend for y'all tonight. Um, at Spring Hill College, we have been working on a course model that we think facilitates problem solving and integrated learning in students. Um, if you, uh, there's a context for signature work handout on your uh, tables, and there's sort of a box at the top that briefly describes the class. The classes have eight to ten student, I mean eight to ten professors. Um, they are uh, based around a problem, a contemporary social problem. Uh, we take field trips. We have speakers in uh, that can speak to field work um, on a global level uh, in the in uh, on whatever topic we're looking at uh, and this course design really came out of a uh, our participation in the AACU shared futures global learning grant program that took place about five years ago and uh, since then we've taught four of these classes uh, one based on petroleum another on human migration one on water and the current class that we're teaching is on food uh, and well, there are a lot of details and logistics that go into the classes, but what we really thought would be more useful for tonight is to focus on the frameworks, the pedagogical frameworks and the actual sort of tools and assignments that we, that we have used with some success, we feel, to produce the kind of thinking and learning that allows students to go out into the world and be problem solvers and, uh, and do the kind of work we hope they can all do. Um, so if I'm going to speak to sort of the top part of this handout, um, where we list sort of a range of frameworks uh, that are useful for cultivating this kind of thinking and learning, interdisciplinarity, problem-based learning, community-based learning. But what I'd actually like to spend a minute talking about is structural learning, that last bullet point at the top. Um, what we have found at Spring Hill is that interdisciplinarity is really alone is not enough to promote problem solving and applied learning in students. Uh, it's a wonderful way to help students understand problems from multiple dimensions, but they need other frameworks in order to help make the transition to applying their knowledge and being able to problem solve in the real world. Um, the two, pro two frameworks that we found particularly useful are uh, stakeholder analysis and a geographical scale. Uh, in, with the concept of stakeholder analysis, we uh, integrate into the classes analysis of whatever we're studying from the major players, uh, the major stakeholders, corporations, people, the environment, communities, um, nonprofits, uh, all the different people who sort of have a piece of the puzzle. And really we found that by um, helping students not understand things not only disciplinary, interdisciplinarily but through stakeholders, they really get a sense of how things function in the real world and where leverage points are that, that you might actually enter in and create change. And that, that so that's been a useful framework for us to, to help give students. Um, geographical scale is another framework that we have found particularly useful. Geographical scale is that series, those nested identities from local to state to regional to national to global that uh, concurrently exist and that we all inhabit and that all of these social problems operate on all of those levels of spatial scale. We found it very useful to help students not just understand um, in the food class, not just to understand hunger as a, uh, as a local issue or a global issue, but both, um, and how it operates and how systems operate at, uh, at the local, state level, national level to solve hunger uh, in, you know, at a statewide or a local level, but then also to look globally at you know, a developing nation and how nonprofits and governments are working at that level to, do, uh, to solve problems in a different way. So uh, we just wanted to propose that you think not only interdis inter through interdisciplinary networks, but also through other things uh, to really help students get an idea of how to understand problems and how to enter in for problem solving. And we wanted to give you some specific tools that we found useful to do that. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Margaret Davis. Hello. I'm Margaret Davis, and I also teach English at Spring Hill College. And I wanted to look, I, I wanted to tell, ask you to look at this list of several assignments that we have used in these interdisciplinary courses. But I want to talk about one of them in particular that we have found 
quite useful, not only in this class, but in other classes as well. And that's the concept map. So if you look on the back of the sheet, you'll see this is the concept map. This is a tool that we learned about at a Shared Futures conference sponsored by AAC and U about five years ago. And this is a tool that helps students make connections between ideas. It furthers the practice of systems thinking and integrated learning. It gives them a visual way of seeing the interconnections and interrelationships of a problem or a concept or an issue that helps lead them towards some end, some solution thinking at the end. There are several ways to use a concept map. The way we've used it in this course is that at the beginning of the interdisciplinary course, students um, work with the instructor on the board constructing the beginning of this map. They generate an original map with the subject at hand, the focus in the middle, and then they draw all the various stakeholders around the outside of the map. And the students begin with this map. And then as the course progresses, they begin to fill in the blanks and see where these various stakeholders push and pull against each other, relate to each other, um, balance or deny each other, and how all, they all work together to influence what happens at the, at the center of it. Um, there's another way to use the map is to start from scratch all together. I've used it one in my American Lit course with the theme is who is this America, this new man? And we use that asking the question is what are all the influences that bear upon the character of Americans from the time of first contact? So we, it works that way. You could also use this map in a, in a small unit of a course, but in, in any way it helps students have a visual image of the way things work together to influence or frame or uh, form a concept and how you can work towards some end. Um, now I want to introduce one of our students who took this course last year, the course that focused on water. Tiffany Thomas is a graduating senior this year and she's going to talk about her experience in the class and what it meant to her. Tiffany. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, to speak broadly about why I think the globalizing classes work from a student's perspective, um, firstly, they help us develop a new framework for examining an issue, and they challenge us to think of issues in a broader way, one that continues to expand as we engage with different members of the faculty and community. It not only calls on us to evaluate the place a need like water occupies in our own lives, but also the place these needs occupy on a national and international scale. It calls on us to evaluate our roles as global citizens as well, what that means and what we can do. Uh, secondly, these classes are practical. Students are incentivized to take them because they're upper level and they offer an alternative interdisciplinary experience that goes beyond the classroom without demanding more time than any other class would. Uh, Spring Hill offers other wonderful opportunities that combine service and learning. Um, the Italy Center is one of the study abroad options, but these are expensive if not with regards to money, then with regards to time. And for many Spring Hill students, they're just not an option, but the globalizing classes are. Uh, they afford students the chance to develop framework skills that can be generalized to other problems while putting students in touch with service opportunities. In the case of my own class, we did Pennies for Pure globally, the Alabama Coastal Foundation locally, and then water conservation efforts on our campus. As I mentioned before, these classes count as an upper level social science, and all students at Spring Hill are required to take at least two. So for me, and I think for other students, I'd rather take an SSC 395, as it appears on our transcript, than an Econ 101, which might be sad for some educators to hear, but it's true. And thirdly, and most important to me, the classes are interdisciplinary. So one of the reasons I chose to take a globalizing course was so that I could learn from faculty members I had never taken before. Um, oftentimes when working towards your degree, you get stuck taking the same types of classes from the same professors, so you can forget about thinking outside of your own cultural standpoint when you can't think outside of your own department. And then uh, to end, I'd like to mention some of the specifics that went into the globalizing water course I took. Um, I'm originally from Kodiak Island, Alaska, and lived for four years on Fort Island in Hawaii before moving to the Mobile Bay area. So water has been integral to my understanding of community and way of life since I was born. Um, and living in Mobile during high school, 
I drove every day over Big Creek Lake, going to and from school, and now living at Spring Hill, I drive past the Mobile Area Water Filtration Plant every time I go visit home. And during our course, we visited this filtration plant, and I learned that Big Creek Lake is the sole water source for Mobile and its municipalities. And then we also learned that Plain South Cap, a private company, filed a lawsuit to seize um, some land from this filtration plant so that they could run an oil pipeline through it. Um, remember that this watershed is the sole source of water for the Mobile area, and remember also what happened in West Virginia when a community's only source of water was contaminated. So that kind of gives you an example of the regional comparisons we were able to make in the class. And then to look at some of the global comparisons, um, one of our um, assignments was the case study that was mentioned before. Um, for my study, I looked at the similarities between the tri-state water wars, which is the current water dispute between Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and compared that to the Indus River water war, which has been a centuries-long kind of conflict between India and Pakistan. So um, I'm going to show you regional versus global. And then another trip that we took was to the Alabama Port Authority, um, which was conveniently timed after a lesson on modern day piracy from a history faculty member. And for those of you that don't know, piracy of cargo ships is a lucrative and surprisingly bureaucratic industry in Somalia. Um, this visit was also timed after speaking with an environmental advocate. Um, Mobile doesn't have the same beautiful waterfront that San Diego does. Our waterfront is almost entirely industrial and the Port Authority is looking to expand it further to increase our global trade something that would come with kind of huge environmental consequences that our Port Authority guide conveniently refused to answer. Um, so you can see how we got out there in the community and compared these issues globally. And these are just some of the major events, but there were numerous um, small assignments that kept us curious and engaged. Uh, we researched art installations that have educational purposes, took water samples around our campus, looked at the role of water in theological texts. Um, the list goes on. And our concept map, as Dr. Davis showed us, it just continued to grow. So that by the end of the class, each of us students was able to examine an issue at the local, regional, national, and global level. And then look at the solutions, too, at each of these levels. And that is everything. Sure. I'll, I'll <coughs> Uh, welcome to San Diego. San, San Diego rocks, right? Uh, I'm Jeff Chase. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies at San Diego State University. And uh, as you've already heard, we have two really interesting institutions represented here. One uh, in Alabama that is on the smaller side, and one here in San Diego that has 35,000 students. Uh, about uh, 7,000 of those students are graduate students. The rest are undergraduates. I want to give you a few quick bullets, and then I'll move right into the introductions. Um, at San Diego State University, we are particularly proud of the fact that in the last 10 years, we've raised our graduation rate more than any research university in the country. Um, we are also particularly proud of the fact that we've done this at a time when we've become more diverse, both ethnically and socioeconomically, and at the six-year rate, we have erased the achievement gap. So we feel as though we have made huge strides. We still have work to do with the four-year graduation rate uh, and the achievement gap at that level, but we've made huge strides. One of the ways in which we've done that is by being what I would call a very engaged university. We're a university that sees itself as engaged in the community locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And one of the things we ask our students to do over and over again is to be engaged, to be engaged, and to be engaged. And we've done this in part by depending on them to come to us, but we've also done it by integrating it into the curriculum in ways that make sure that they are engaged. And there are some fact sheets in front of you which you can look through. Uh, but I'm going to introduce the students now and let them uh, tell their story. The first one to my left is Anthony Rodriguez. Anthony uh, is graduating this year. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, <clears throat> He uh, has been, uh, you can read about his major, biology major. Uh, he's been, uh, also received the uh, interdisciplinary minor in honors 
Uh, he's been very engaged on campus. He has studied in China, uh, which he's not going to talk about today. Uh, and he recently has just been won uh, one of the very few Quest for the Best awards, which is given every year to a few select students at San Diego State uh, for their outstanding, uh, outstanding contributions to the university. So he's really done a tremendous job. And I'm going to introduce all three of them, and then I'm just going to let them I'm going to let them run with it. Uh, next to Anthony is Sitlali Chima. Sitlali uh, is majoring in, I think, about six subjects, right? Uh, she's also pursuing an uh, interdisciplinary minor, interdisciplinary um, honor, uh, minor in honors. Um, she has just recently, within the past week, been notified that she has won one of the Critical Language Scholarship Awards, and she will be going to Oman this summer uh, to study uh, Arabic. Uh, she has also, she's going to talk a little bit about another international experience she's had, and then in next fall she's going to Turkey. Uh, and then next to Sitlali is Karen Islas, and Karen will talk about her experience uh, growing, all three of these students, by the way, are from San Diego, so this kind of interesting. Uh, and Karen has, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about a project in which she's been engaged. Uh, she graduated last May with a degree in civil engineering from San Diego State University. She's already been hired and is working for the city of San Diego as a civil engineer and is pursuing her licensure there and uh, is on track to get that uh, in short order. So let me start by asking Anthony and uh, then he'll turn it to Sit Lolly and then Karen. All right, hello everyone. Um, so just a little bit of, about myself is that when I came to San Diego State, I originally thought I was going to go into medicine. And so hopefully today, um, through the engagement and significant work, I'll talk to you about uh, how, what was part of this transition and uh, this transformation to go into uh, something completely new. Um, but uh, again, my hometown is San Diego, and something special about me is that my father actually works at San Diego State University. So I grew up with the university um, over the years. Um, so when I came to San Diego State, I had this love for the university, and I just wanted to share with other people. Um, so my role on campus is as an SDSU ambassador. We are the official student representatives, tour guides, and orientation leaders. Um, and then most people call me the walking encyclopedia of all fun facts on campus. <laughs> um, and part of what I wanted to do in this role um, is to combat the different perceptions, negative perceptions of San Diego State. So historically, uh, SDSU has been tagged as a party school and even coming in in the fall of 2011, there were still remnants of the national drug bust. And I wanted to be that example that um, that students are making a difference here. And um, th my project is not something typical where you take it from point A to point B. It was going to be something that still I can't, um, can't accomplish, uh, and that is to create a campus culture uh, and to engage students in uh, high achievement. Um, so part of my work uh, is to be the first face of the university and all these at these points is working with new students and, and parents at such a critical time which is um, their first uh, experience on campus. Um, so being a student representative again we're, we're a very diverse university with over 35,000 students um, so a group of about 80 of us have that responsibility to um, be the voice for students and to uh, bring our campus community together and that's really special. And then on my, uh, on my campus tours, you can think of, these, uh, of an individual who's very outgoing, you know, high energy, and that could be me. Uh, but most importantly is creating those uh, life-changing experiences. So, um, many times when I'm walking around campus, you know, just going to class, I'll have students that come up to me out of nowhere and they'll say, hey, like I was, uh, I was your, you were my campus tour guide, now I'm here and I'm so thankful that you're, you know, I'm here at San Diego State and that just moves me and it, it reminds me, wow, that one hour tour is something that for that individual is uh, going to put them on a different path and that I have that experience to do that too. And then at orientation, uh, this is the transition period for our students, whether they are transfers um, or that uh, are first time freshmen. And there it is uh, really critical that they feel at home and they feel like they are informed of um, how they are going to succeed academically and personally. Um, so getting uh, that one on one experience with uh, us ambassadors is will put them right on the right track to here at SDSU. 
Um, so I guess my passion um, when I was in my junior year going in, thinking I was going to go into medicine, I, I realized that I was at this point where um, I didn't see that as a career. And what I really uh, had to think about hard is what what did really motivate me to, um, and what made me happy, and that was my job being an ambassador. Um, and so my, right now I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing a career in higher education because I really value um, having that student-to-student -student interaction and uh, seeing the, the different growth that you can achieve with students, um, which in my day-to-day uh, -day work is through different conversations, but knowing that it's the little things that build up and those little things build a campus culture of excellence and that's what we're doing at San Diego State uh, and I'm really proud to share that with you all. So I'm going to turn it over to Sit Lolly. Okay, um, good evening everyone. My name is Sit Lolly Chima. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Sit Lolly Chima and I'm a current international business major at San Diego State. I'm a local student and when I first uh, started at San Diego State, I didn't really know what I wanted to pursue like most students, but I did know for a fact that I wanted to study abroad because I felt like it was the most effective way to immerse yourself in a culture. And so far, I've actually studied abroad twice, and I have two more coming up, which I'm really excited about. Um, and the first, well, actually, most recently, last year, I went, I interned abroad in Amman, Jordan, where I studied Arabic as well. Um, but today, I kind of wanted to talk more about my experience in Bolivia during the summer of 2013. And when the opportunity arose to go to Bolivia, I was really intrigued because the program was centered around sustainable development, which was something that interests me, but um, I didn't really know how to incorporate it into my academics. So when we arrived in Bolivia, um, Bolivia was just such a great experience because nothing ever went right, and if it did went right, we were always late. And um, the first, it was day one, and we had to walk 10 kilometers through a roadblock. And it already, I was like, oh my goodness. And then I remember, um, it's probably, we were almost going home, and I just remember dangling from this cliff. I don't even know how I got up there, but I was dangling from this cliff, and I really was questioning my life decisions, you know? And, um, but these kinds of, um, these kinds of experiences really make you realize how important study abroad is. Um, they're just one of a kind and unforgettable. Um, and, and I feel like everyone brings back a memorable experience from studying abroad. And mine was definitely the concept of um, Pachamama, which is uh, Mother Earth. And it was really interesting to see one night we were in this small town called Toro Toro. And it was, there was a holiday and we were in this small home. And the woman brought out a orange pail filled with this uh, brown substance. It reeked of corn and... Um, because it's been fermented for a couple days before we got it. And I remember watching the Bolivian men take bowls of it, but before they would drink it, they would drop about half of it on the floor. And I was really interested in what was going on, and I later uh, found out that they did this to thank Mother Earth for all that they've given them, um, because Boliv Bolivians, um, their societies, well, the societies we visit, the communities, they were uh, agriculturally based. So um, they believe that Mother Earth or Pachamama would, um, she oversaw harvesting and planting. And in order to thank her for everything, they honored her by doing this ritual. And it was just really, at that moment, I just realized it gave a new meaning to the um, word Mother Earth for me. And it's really something that I've kept um, with me, um, even though it's been a couple years. And returning from Bolivia, um, I was introduced to this world of international development and globalizations, and I was really frustrated about it. I was just really, I wanted answers, I wanted to learn more, so I immediately added a international security and conflict resolution minor, it's kind of like international relations, and it was uh, by far the most, it was the best decision I've made in the, my last four years at State, just because, um, of course it didn't give me any solutions or answers because Globalization is so hard and international development, but I was able to build upon all my knowledge in um, that I learned up in Bolivia and build upon everything that I've learned of, and I've been able to tie back 
everything, all my experiences. Like the other day in class, we were talking about international development. And I was like, oh my goodness, Bolivia, it just all ties in. And it was just incredible. Um, and then more recently, I became part of the faculty student mentoring program. And unsurprisingly, I researched sustainable behaviors in Latino communities. And I decided to do this kind of project just because I really wanted to see um, whether this idea of Mother Earth uh, changes once people uh, move to different uh, communities or you know like when they move from a developing country to a developed country to see what acculturation does what kind of effects on their environmental attitudes and whether they sustain these beliefs or if they diminish as they acculturate and just to conclude um, these study abroad opportunities I sought out were much more than short experiences that ended once I left the country. Um, at SDSU, I was able to integrate them into my coursework every semester and, um, and continue and into many different projects and continue to build upon my knowledge, reinforcing the experience. And I learned that in the global society we live in, um, everything's changing, everything's so fast paced, but to understand it, you need to understand that we need an international education, I feel like. and. Um, my study abroad experiences have allowed me to develop a global awareness, understanding problems that can only be understood outside a classroom setting, and for that, I'm just really grateful. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Okay, I would like to know who else here knew that San Diego State University was chosen by the oldest and largest diversity magazine in higher education called Insight into Diversity as the recent winner for two consecutive years of the Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award. This is awesome. I cannot believe I didn't know this before doing some research. Like, this should be shared with everyone. This award is open to all colleges and universities throughout the nation. And San Diego State was selected for its exemplary diversity and inclusion initiatives. Students from all backgrounds are, ac are actually achieving academic excellence and graduation and retention rates are improving steadily. This is so cool. I'm absolutely proud to be part of these numbers. I was born here in San Diego and was raised in the city of Tijuana, Mexico. I spend my life, I still do, crossing back and forth this region, which by the way is the busiest border, land border crossing in the world. About 40 million people yearly. See, Lali and I were recently talking about how cool it is to drive from North County, San Diego, and to South County, San Diego, and people will be pronouncing your name differently. Such an adventure, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so when I finished high school in Tijuana, I decided to pursue my career goal of becoming a civil engineer. I asked myself, what do I want to achieve? How am I going to do it? And the most important question, where do I want to start? So I was doing some research and asking around, and I ended up deciding that I wanted to be a civil engineer in the US. There were plenty of reasons regarding this decision, but I consider that the main one for me was that I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about new ways, new challenges, new lifestyles, and I started drawing my path. Uh, I, I did two and a half years of community college, junior college, then transferred to San Diego State. I cannot be happier about the decisions I made back then. Like, the full college experience was extraordinary. We had associations, we had clubs, we had, we had events like career fairs, wonderful people with different backgrounds, the weather, um, closeness to my family and friends and awesome opportunities for career networking. So um, close to the finish line, I started talking to people in the engineering field. These people were in the industry working for contractors, government, consulting firms. And you know what almost everyone told me? They were very grateful about what San Diego State taught them because they became more prepared and less scared to work thanks to the hands-on experience provided by the university. So San Diego State not only made us learn about formulas and theorems, like actually San Diego State taught us how to apply these in the real world, which is the hardest part. So for my last semester at San Diego State, I got the opportunity to choose my final engineering design project. Uh, it is required to obtain my degree. So among the options, my class gave me one I couldn't miss. 
creating a project which will possibly be changing people's quality of life even before graduating, I was like, okay, yes, that's awesome. And uh, so yeah, basically we had to deliver a project that was, um, was part of the SAGE project. So if you're not familiar with this, you may ask yourself, what is the SAGE project? Okay, so the SAGE project is a partnership between San Diego State University and a local government in the San Diego region. Uh, we had to deliver a project that was compliant with the government agency with a school coursework, you know, to get an A, and, uh, and with the Sustainable City Program of the SAGE. So this was up to my team to either achieve or fail remarkably. And after all the punching and kicking, the results were awesome. Um, basically, my project, um, it, it was called Downtown Green Street, and it was a combination of stormwater and transportation-related infrastructure. So we had to improve and uh, try to implement a design that will um, be compliant to the, what we call complete street. So it's a safe environment between pedestrians, bikes, uh, public transportation, and of course vehicles. And at the same time, we had to create stormwater management systems to prevent stormwater runoff contamination. So, you know, all these things. And, um, so yeah, the results were awesome, and uh, the project ended up having awards from the Institute of Transportation Engineers and American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, we got a returnees to interview for local newspapers and Spanish-speaking local TV news also. Um, it was presented to the City Council of National City, California, where this project, um, uh, the, the street was located at, so we, the, that was our, our focus point. Um, for implementation in the following months, and actually I just found out um, that in May 5th, they're gonna start, um, there's gonna be the ribbon cutting for the construction of the project. So that's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, it was also presented to US Environmental Protection Agency directors and administrators like Gina McCarthy from Washington, D.C. And uh, that was back in October, and um, it also, it was, the, the, all these things ha happened, I remember, oh yeah, also we got um, recent nominations for Green Business of the Year 2013 and Community Leader Award at the National Cities Chamber of Commerce. And, well, and I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I would just like to say that San Diego State University provides opportunities for every student to embrace these awesome Mark Twain's quote that is like, be yourself, everyone else is already taken <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know it's like San Diego State allows you to achieve these and beyond like I think this was just the beginning so thank you very much <laughs> Those are great stories of finding purpose, all of them, and finding purpose somehow within yourself, in your heart, in your mind, and in interaction with others at the institution. Uh, I'd like to give you a chance to ask any questions. If you would like to ask about the programs, about the stories, following that, we're going to invite you to have table conversations and to think about what you might do at your home institution to make it possible for more and more students. And let's go for the challenge, all students, to have experiences that would allow them to get to the sense of life purpose that these students have achieved. It is so moving, and I think it is so possible if we put our hearts and minds into it. So would anyone, and do you have anything you'd like to say or ask of each other, or would anyone in the audience like to ask any question of a panelist? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add something. Uh, Karen ended with a Mark Twain quote, and I know earlier you kind of challenged as students to find something that sets us on fire. Um, being from a Jesuit university, we're obsessed with quoting St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuit society, and his major quote to students is, go forth and set the world on fire. Go forth and find that thing that you love and just kind of light it up, so that's all. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yes. Yes, and I think there is a mic right there, if you'd like 
And I think you're a student from Tulane University. Okay, I, but I'm forgetting your name. Mm -hmm. um, my name's Eddie. Um, I'm a senior at Tulane University. I'm gonna graduate this May as well. And I'm a community engagement advocate with the Center for Public Service. So we're sort of here, a lot of community engagement advocates are here, and we're here to sort of see how engagement in community and having this really um, impactful types of learning affect students and, and those sorts of resources. But one of the things I had a question about in terms of, I know um, one of the things that was given to us was the pedagogy and like the sort of infrastructure of that. And also maybe um, this might be more directed towards uh, the Dean of San Diego's uh, undergraduate studies, but how, how have you um, been able to create faculty and professors that can back up these really like innovative and progressive things? Because I, from what I've heard a lot of in some, in some of the places here in this conference is that a lot of faculty and professors there's some sort of a resistance uh, sometimes, especially with tenure track and more um, traditional um, sort of European styled <laughs> form of education. So in terms of your own, st in, the, in your own infrastructure, how have you been able to sort of fight against that and create professors who care and who can create environments for students to have these opportunities? Um. Well, as you know, the course model, we have nine or ten professors that come together to teach these different classes, and uh, we put out a call to the whole faculty with, there's a steering committee that decides on a topic, and we've had really a really a rich response, and I think one thing, it is a lot to have nine professors, but I think one thing that does is start from the very beginning that no one owns the whole class, everybody, uh, everybody can contribute a piece, and so I think that kind of decreases territoriality and increases buy-in and actually we've had a lot of interest um, one of the nicest things there are very few times when faculty members from across campus are have an opportunity to get together and work on something um, that's not a institution-wide committee to deliver something to the accreditation board or something I mean, to get together and work on a teaching project together um, and it's generated a lot of excitement and um, just because it's fun. I mean, it's fun to work with other good teachers to come up with innovative ways to deliver something meaningful to students. Um, we don't pay people a lot. People actually sign up for this. It's an overload. I mean, they do it on top of what they are normally teaching, uh, and they get a piddling stipend just to sort of recognize the fact that they have participated. But I think that people really, um, there is a desire to be a part of innovative things and to work with each other and do um, and, and make a difference on things that seem um, contemporary and interesting and pressing. So I think those are ways that we've dealt with that or that. Anyone else want to take that? I'll just say very, very briefly, the SAGE project that Karen was describing involves about 30 faculty a year and somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 students per year working in one city. That's all voluntary and what happens is the faculty see a list of projects that a city generates and it could be everything from a graphic design challenge to dealing with stormwater runoff to dealing with neighborhood uh, stores and getting more healthy food in those stores to dealing with an arts council. Those get spread across the curriculum on a voluntary basis. But what we have found is that faculty are now coming to us saying, so how do I get involved? So we haven't found so much resistance as we're trying to generate more and more projects. Rebecca. I have a question. You're that Rebecca has, Mark from Tulane. I'm Rebecca Mark from Tulane University. And Susan Albertine and I used to work we together 30,000 years, years ago. Years ago. <laughs> uh, I am concerned about what you're addressing right here. And that is I'm concerned about young faculty because I see them, yes, volunteering and some older faculty too for these new initiatives. Where I actually think the excitement lives in higher education. So in those new projects, I think we're actually doing what sh we should be doing all over the whole curriculum. And so what's beginning to happen is the university is getting twice as much from us for the same amount of money. And from as an old Marxist communist person, I really 
it really bothers me in the name of innovation and excitement and social entrepreneurship and all of these new things that we're doing, people are literally volunteering their time, teaching an extra course, doing an extra thing. And I am all for it being passionate and exciting, but I also want to live long enough to see the flip side where we infect where we infect the university p to be doing this in the regular classroom right. and paying us for our labor. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you. So let me just be real clear about the SAGE project. Faculty do it voluntarily in the courses they're teaching anyway. It's not extra courses. There are no extra courses. So. Mm -hmm. I would just also, I mean, say that, um, you know, it has been financial constraints are a reality at our institution. Um, and one of the things that has been good about this program is it's something that we could do and deliver. Um, I get a course release to coordinate the class, uh, and then we pay stipends, you know, a small stipend, as I said, to the people there. But um, sort of on the proven track record of this, our provost has recognized the value of this and is has um, sort of looked towards the way the investment in the class could be ramped up to do exactly what you're saying, to compensate people a little bit more um, for, uh, for their innovation, ingenuity, and contributions. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good cautionary question that we really have to think about faculty, careers, promotion, retention, some of the really tough questions about roles and rewards if we want to get to all. I think that's the concept that, that you've introduced here. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. I just want to ask a question about, um, you know, um, there are a lot of partnerships between, uh, you know, internships in the private sector and internships in the, the nonprofit community that I've seen grow up. How did y'all work, get, how did you forge the bond with the city? That's much less common, I think, to have people doing um, work for a governmental institution. How did y'all forge that um, connection? Well, uh, we stole the idea from the University of Oregon, frankly. <laughs> it's called, the, the, at the University of Oregon, it's the Sustainable City of the Year Initiative. And I knew the director and the, the people who started that program. I invited them down here. And then I invited uh, city and um, uh, some county people from around the area that I knew. And we had a one-day session. And uh, coming out of that day, National City said, we want to do this. And that's how we did it. Um, we then, this last fall, we did National City. This is our second year. And then next fall, we're going to start with a new city in San Diego. And we did that on a uh, competitive basis. So we put out an RFP and cities applied. And then we looked at their projects. And we shared the projects with faculty across the curriculum and said, is this something you would put into your courses? not do extra, but put into your courses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so next year, the community is called Santee, um, and it's in a different part of San Diego, and so that's our project uh, for next year. Great, thank you. Yes, and tell us who you are, where you're from. Please. So my name is Zila Fernandez, and I teach at Foothill College, so I'm with that oh, with amazing the, group that, of students. Yes, there. lots of students. Congratulations. So my question is about stereotype threat. I want to know, um, what students, what are the strategies that you use when stereotyped? Because the other side of that is when you have a degree and you decide to pursue education, there's cultural taxation, which means you, res you represent a population that is underrepresented and you're supposed to shoulder the task of moving forward. So it's the flip side of that coin. Um, when it should be the responsibility of the entire institution because we are researched, educated, professionals that know the statistics for a long time. So the achievement gap is not a new phenomenon. So the task is, I mean, uh, the task to me seems, we have done the research, we know the information. And so now, looking at you, how do you move forward, especially when sometimes the faculty seems exhausted, taxed, tapped out, um, suggestions, ideas, and um, addressing the achievement gap. Um, so as I said, we have closed the achievement gap at the six-year graduation rate. 
Um, and, we, and we have no majority population on our campus. So we don't, uh, so I don't know how to answer your question really. Uh, I'll be clear, our faculty are very tired, right? <laughs> the state of California has not provided a lot of funding to higher education in the last seven years. So our faculty work extraordinarily hard. Uh, we have very dedicated faculty. I think the key for us has been to find ways to integrate these kinds of projects into work that's already being done rather than to add it on as a separate program. And this is why the SAGE project, I think, is such a transformative, and, uh, and once again, I'm gonna give University of Oregon credit here, Mark Schlossberg and, and his uh, colleague Nico Lara, uh, because it's really a brilliant shift that says, we're just going to put this into courses that already exist. Students don't have to seek it out, and faculty don't have to add something that they wouldn't put in anyway. It's a, it's a case study from National City, City instead of a case study from a textbook. That's, that's kind of the difference. So I think to the extent we, we, we we can, what we've tried to do is integrate this into the curriculum in a way that ensures that um, that students are going to get that. Um, I don't know, do you want, can any of you answer this question? They're all. Do you want to answer the, to address stereotype threat? I can go for that. Does somebody yeah, want to? Go, Anthony. I guess for me, when I uh, get these kind of questions, it's from you know very concerned parents um, that are wondering where their student is coming, and they want to make sure that they're doing well. And I think for just a t touch on your diversity piece is that even within our amb ambassadors organization, we really try um, to re to make sure that our you know our representatives at university represent you know are the representatives and touch on those under underrepresented populations and identities. Um, and for stereo, uh, for stereotypes, I guess it's really, um, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. So I mean, for us, it's really about, you know, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that example for student uh, students, and I'm going to be that student leader and engage people into those kind of conversations, um, you know, about you know the diversity of our campus and how can we make that change. Um, and it's not through making these, you know, big things that we're going to change everything. It's really about like the compassion on campus and um, students helping students and that's what the, my, the organization of ambassadors is all about so just to touch on your part. Can I add just one, one thing? Sure. So one of the things that's interesting on our campus is the risk factor that is the highest is commuting students. It's not academic preparation. It's commuting students. So the students who live on campus do better than the students who don't. So one of the things we've done now is develop a commuter center. We've got outreach programs to commuter students. We have learning communities for commuter students. So that's, I mean, that's how we address some of, we're always looking at the data to see, so which is the population that we're not doing as much for that we need to do more for? Mm -hmm. And, and maybe there's a way in which we're modeling something new in the discussion that we're having this evening. I don't think it's all that typical for faculty and staff and students to address some of these questions together. And that might be a very good idea for intergroup dialogue on campus um, as, as a way to start some community organizing. Um, and there, there are lots of guides for doing that but I think the important difference is that if we really are serious about empowering students to find something that they're passionate about, we ought to be really serious about having that conversation with students and faculty on equal grounds. And, and to, I, I always find anyway that, that students love talking about what it means to have a college education. Um, that matters a lot, and they don't always get a chance, or you don't always get a chance to be involved in that. So maybe that is one of the ways that we start to address some of the, the really deeply rooted challenges that we face it, in, in this society of, of stereotype threat and, and the bad things that it does um, as a community that can be compassionate and learn to talk across difference. Um, I, w if anybody else would like to add to that, you are welcome to do it. We've 
kind of took the conversation in another direction, but I always like to be responsive when, when people ask questions. Um, what, what we had imagined, what we expected to do is to give you some time now to talk at your tables about what your campus might do that would be different to move in the direction of signature work for all students in, in the ways that we've just been discussing it, with the, some of the values and goals that we've been discussing. And we're very happy to do that and to stay here and to see how your conversations go. And if it looks as if people are having good, vital conversations and you want to share some ideas, we'll have a chance at the end, about a half an hour uh, from now, maybe a little less than that, maybe we'll go 20 minutes, and we'll see what discoveries you've made or what other questions you've had. So I invite you to talk at your table. Is there something that you're doing now that resembles this? Could you do it better? And how could you think about assessing whether you're getting where you want to? So enjoy the conversation. <laughs>